Welcome. I want to start off by saying thank you for watching another episode of Join the Team. I am Officer Tony Rodriguez with Lansing Police Department. I am a community service police officer with our community service unit. I get the opportunity to walk our beautiful streets every day and meet with businesses and owners for this great city. I'm one of many community officers that are placed around the city and are given smaller areas of responsibility. Our goal is to meet with the residents to develop that community relationship with its residents, with the employees that travel to the city, and with the guests that want to see what our city has to offer. In this episode of Join the Team, you will be going on an awesome ride along with Officer Tori McNutt. You will be given the opportunity to see some of the calls for service that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. You will also get safety tips from our community service officer, Kasha Osborne. The Lansing Police Chief, Mike Jankowski, will be talking about our 125 year anniversary. You will be given information on the City of Lansing detention and Lansing's Most Wanted. Again, I want to thank you for watching another episode of Join the Team. Enjoy. So, going to an assault call right now on uh, MLK. It's in Sector 1, so it's another north end um, unit. So I'm in sector two, but we're going because girlfriend slapped her boyfriend and now the parties are separated, so we're going to back up another unit. They normally send two officers to any call. So with domestic, since you know there's two parties involved, it's easier to send two officers anyways. So like he can talk to the victim and I can talk to the accused. It just makes it a lot easier. Was that, you want me to run to the front office? To ask to get in or? Here, I might go. Is he up there? Go around. Yeah. Yeah, so normally when we get calls like this, sometimes the doors aren't locked, but for a lot of apartment complexes, they're not. So um, right now, normally if it's locked and we can't get in, we have to call dispatch, and then dispatch will call the caller back if they're not still on the phone with the caller, and then that lets them come down and unlock the doors for us so we can get in. Hey. You okay, sir? Yeah. Is she still? Okay, well, before you walk in your apartment, let's talk to us in the hallway for a second, okay? They were on the couch, and her dog attacked my dog. Okay. So okay. I slapped her dog to get her off her, and she stood up and hit me. Okay. Okay, where'd she hit you? On the face, right here. Okay, will you shine your light one more time? Yeah. Okay, do you want an ambulance to come just take a look at you? No. no okay. Sorry. Okay, well, uh, we're going to go in there and try to talk to her, okay? Is it or is it? Hey. Okay. And it was just so mild that you know dogs get into it. No, I got it. I got two dogs, so I understand. Yeah, and then all of a sudden he's just whipping over and slapping. They, it was this was in here when this happened. Yeah, when we you, were just sitting here. Okay, when you slapped, you were sitting both here. Yeah. When you slapped him like you, you did it open. You did it like open hand or close fist. Don't, you can't be, you know, just striking animals. People, I got it. Or I got like it. Give that. me one second, okay? Okay. Hey, Wilson, are you? Yeah. Okay. Hey. Look, do me a favor and stand up, okay, hon? Do you have any easy shoes you can put on? Do you have any easy shoes you can put on? Okay, so listen, I get the frustration. I understand that he hit your dog, okay? And all of what you told me is gonna go in the report, okay? okay. But unfortunately, you guys are in a dating relationship. You guys live together, that's domestic violence. Even if, even if you slapped him in the face, okay? One time, okay? You still can't do that, all right? So we got to place you under arrest, okay? So uh, the cuffs are double locked now, so not going to get too tight on you, okay? Okay, let's get you some shoes. We'll get you a coat. 25, we'll have one under. 
But like I told you though, everything's gonna be put in the report, okay? I don't want you to think I'm not putting anything in the report. Everything you've told me is gonna get put in the report. Everything that your boyfriend has told Officer Olson is gonna go in the report, okay? Okay, let's get you a coat. Which one do you want? Oh. Do you want your keys? Yes. Do you want um, do you want everything out of your wallet or do you just want your money and your ID? Where's your phone? That, that, that right there, there should be one in there. That's what I'm saying. Do you want everything in that wallet? Do you want to bring the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. You you want to just, yeah. Okay. Go ahead and wait for me real quick, okay? No, no, I'm not. What you I'm going to slap charges on you for animal Come on. Okay. And I'm calling the office. All right. I'll be right back with some information for you, okay, sir? Okay, when we get out there, I gotta pat you down and everything, okay? Both of them. Just came in together. You got her ID? Okay, cool. You want, yeah, I'll just put it in here. Um. Thanks. Okay. I'm gonna get this back on this side, okay? So now I have to pull a report number. We can only do it on the computer, so I'm gonna pull a report number. So Officer Olson, he has to give the victim, which is the male inside, he has to give him the case report number so when it goes to court that he has the report number for the prosecutor. So every time we transport somebody, we have to let dispatch know if it's, since I'm female and the um, accused in the back is a female, I don't have to give the mileage from start to when we finish getting to where we're going. But if it was a male, I would have to call out like the mileage over the radio and then when I'm leaving here and then when we get there, I would have to let them know the mileage too. So when you give the mileage, it just shows approximately like exactly where we're going. So it shows that we didn't like go out, go the long way, go out of our way or do other things when we have somebody in the back of our car. Transporting one female to lockup. So these are um, cameras in the car, and these record um, what's in front of us, or they can record in the back seat. So when we're transporting somebody, we have to turn this on, and it records her the entire time in the back of the car. So when you get an arrest on any situation, especially this is going to be considered domestic. Um, but anytime you get it in custody, you have to take them straight to the jail. Um, and then we have to write up the report before we can leave the jail. So it doesn't sit, um, we call it in a queue, so your report doesn't sit in the queue. So you have to get it done right away. So we're pulling in here, this is our, this is the headquarters. But anytime we take somebody to jail, they come to our jail, which is in the headquarters, which is right downtown, um, right by the Capitol. So then before we take them up to the jail, we're required, we have to park down here, and then we bring them up through the elevators to our jail. All right. I'll uh, get you out of here, okay? If you, go ahead and step out. So we're gonna go through these blue doors, okay? Have you been here before? Yeah. Okay, let me step over here. Um, go on, on the elevator, just go stand in that corner, okay? Just face the corner for me, just for a minute, okay? Um, I'm gonna check. I don't. I didn't get to check if you have any warrants or anything, but they'll run it up here and let you know. Okay. Well, I want to go. Oh, also, they're gonna make you take a PBT. Okay, you're not in trouble. What they just have to know how much you've been drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Elevator opens. Take a step out for me. Okay, and stand in front of this door right here on the left. So anytime we take anybody to jail before we can go actually in the jail, we have to take our duty weapons out. Um, and then if you have a knife, put it in here. So we can't bring it into the jail. You lock it, gets locked, you take your keys. The lady that we just brought in, she blew a .3. So anytime they blow a .3 for your PPT for alcohol, if she's not on the way down, then we have to take her to the hospital because it's basically an unsafe level. So we're gonna wait 15 minutes to see if she goes down. Um, she goes down, it's probably okay. If she goes up, then Officer Olson's gonna have to take her to Sparrow for it. But right now, so we have like 15 minutes, we're just gonna write some of the report. So yeah, like I said before, when it's anything like a restful offense, we have to do the report. So waiting while we're waiting the 15 minutes, we're just gonna try to knock out as much of the report as possible. So he's accusing her of slapping him. So that's a one-sided story. And it was a, a weak slap. There wasn't any uh, visible marks, but that she confirmed it made it more we, solidified. We, it made, it, it, we had to take action at that point. You know, keep them from doing that again, hopefully. For domestic calls, on average, I'd say most officers at least do one a, one a shift. So I would say domestics have to be at least 
forty percent of our call call load. I mean, easily. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say at least one or two uh, domestics a shift per officer. I think sometimes it is it is easier if I talk to the female and he talks to the male, just because people seem to want to talk to I think the same sex, mm -hmm. but. In this instance, I think it was just a little bit easier for him to talk t to him. And the females normally, if it's a female talking to a female, they normally will be more personable and talk to you about specific things that happen because they feel more comfortable. Like, you know, if something, if she got hit in the chest, it's easier for her to talk about it. And if she has injuries, show me the injuries. Whereas Officer Olsen, she wouldn't feel as comfortable talking to him about that stuff. Why is it do you know sometimes it doesn't put their age in there when you put the date of birth? Yeah, I don't know why it's inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's fifty four. Yeah. I felt like a child doing that, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to make sure I didn't get a math degree. That's right. So when we get uh, arrests, especially, uh, the reports obviously take a little bit longer, but personally, probably I, depending, well, depending on the day, if it's like a swamp day where it's a lot more like report calls, um, honestly, you could easily spend four hours of a 10 hour shift writing reports, just depending on how much, but I mean, probably over my career, it's probably close to half the time I've spent in law enforcement writing reports. After the 15 minutes were up, they were able to test her BAC, um, her blood alcohol level, with the PBT. So she was at a 3.0, so 3.0 is like I said before, it's considered to be like a dangerous um, blood alcohol level. But because we waited the 15 minutes, we're trying to see if her blood alcohol level was gonna go up. If she was gonna go up, we're gonna take her to the hospital, but it went down to a two, eight something. So we were able to book her in to jail. So when you book somebody into jail, you have to research them. Um, we'll, check like all their pockets, everything, pat them down, take their shoes off, take their laces off. If they have laces in anything like a shirt or like hoodie strings, we have to cut them out. Um, while they were, while the detention officers were looking through her personal belongings, um, so you have to search all that too. They found little pills, um, different, look like prescription kind of pills. We don't know obviously what they were. Um, so Officer Olson, we have them collected in a bag. All these different ones. You normally, you can charge somebody, you cannot. It's totally kind of up to you. But as of right now, since we don't know what we're dealing with, she's saying that there, she's saying that there's some of her prescription medicines. We're gonna, um, we have to go tag them into the evidence room as evidence and yes. so they'll be stored away. So just so she can't have them anymore. Cause if you don't have, you, if you have pills like this and they're not in a um, pill bottle with your name on them, then that's actually, you can be arrested for it. If you carry loose pills on you at any time, doesn't matter if they're like town or not, technically you can actually get in trouble for carrying loose pills. So I'm sure my partner already explained it and everybody's explained it. You can't be carrying that stuff for serious charge. So you're getting lucky today. So yeah, these will, we'll take them up to the evidence room. There's different like class fills that you can do with them, but we're gonna log these in as to be destroyed. That's, that's LPD. I mean, we have days where we're not super busy, but more towards the end of our shift, coming on day shift, like 10.30 and beyond, it gets pretty busy. And then noons is swamped the whole time, and midnights is, it's hit or miss, but midnights when stuff goes down, they have like really high priority calls. So, I mean, even they're busy. All of our shifts are pretty busy. So, but we all work as a team, so there's no reason to freak out because everything's gonna get done one way or the other. So yeah, I'll put this. So this is the property room at headquarters. So I had to come in and we have to tag these pills in here and then they get destroyed. So when it's pills, um, when you're tagging in pills to the property room or drugs of any kind, they want them in a clear package. Even though it's already sealed all in this, you want it in a clear package. Um, so we'll put it in this heel seat package. So that so the evidence room can see what it is. Um, so we'll tuck it down in there, and then we're gonna heat we're gonna heat seal it. And then anytime when you get anything like this, you want to write across the heat seal. You want to put your initials 
And then I normally put my badge number too, just to show that I'm the one that tagged it in as evidence. Anytime after you log in something as evidence, you have to print out a label also that's gonna go on the heat sale bag. Um, so it basically has a barcode on it and it lets our HQ, which is the people that work evidence on full time, be able to basically scan it into the system. So you just gotta put the label on it. After you put up the label on it and you're done with it in the computer, you'll come, there's these, all these lockers. <laughs> you'll put it in a locker and you'll just put a lock on it. So it doesn't let anybody else get in the locker besides HQ when they need to grab it. And then, so I'm done with that. But yeah, so in here I can run you through some stuff. So anytime you get like a blood sample or like a, a CSC kit, which a CSC kit is a rape kit, um, you pick it up from the hospital and you have to tag it in here after the hospital does it, but you'll put stuff like that, like stuff that needs to be temperature wise, you put it in the refrigerator. Um, any bigger items, like maybe backpacks or anything like that, they're gonna go in these bigger lockers. Anything smaller like I had are gonna go in all these smaller lockers. Um, anytime, that, if it's a biohazard, so if it is blood, You'll take it out and you'll put like one of the biohazard stickers on it. Or if it's a weapon, we have stickers that are for loaded weapons and non-loaded. So if you were to get a gun or any kind of weapon like that, you have to tag it in up here in the evidence room. You would get one of these boxes that says gun evidence box. You'll make it into a box. But the holes in it are so when you lay the gun in here, you put these zip ties around the guns um, and you'll basically hold, hold it, zip tie it into the box. You want to make sure the magazine and no bullets are in the gun, though, if you can. But that's what we use if you have a gun. Um, if you get like a, um, if you get needles, possible heroin needles or anything like that, you're going to put them in one of these for evidence. You're still going to put it in a heat sale bag after, so the property room can see it. But you'll just make sure you put it in here first. So we always carry a couple of those. Um, these are Nick tests. Nick tests are used um, for different kind of drugs. Like if we had marijuana, I mean. Not, I can't really open it and show you exactly, but um, it's basically a package. You'll put some of the suspected marijuana in there. There's tubes. You'll break them, shake it for a minute. If um, if the fluid on the inside turns purple, then that means it tests positive for marijuana. So those are like different things that we'll use. This is this is a cocaine one, but this is what I was talking about. So there's a fluid type in here, and it basically indicates telling you if it if it's test positive for cocaine-based substance. So you would, if you had it, you would sprinkle a little bit of powder in there. There's three test tubes, you'll break them, the fluid will come out and fill this up, and you'll basically just shake it. If it turns a certain color, that means it's testing positive for that substance. Other than that, if you ever get lost and you don't know what to do, there's all this stuff up here that basically helps officers because it gets confusing, but it lets you know what to do with different kinds of things. And then there's the ref reference guide, so if we never know how to do anything, um, you can kind of look through here and, and it will basically walk you through step by step of what to do. So this is the property room. Can't really take you back there because we have classified information and all that stuff. Um, but anytime we log in property, the people that work in the property room, HQ, they'll come take it and it gets all placed back in here and it's, it's organized and I don't really know obviously exactly how it works, but they organize it and they have everything. So when it comes time for a case to come or anything like that, then that's how it gets taken care of. Hello, my name is Officer Kasha Osborne with the Lansing Police Department. I am currently assigned to the Community Services Unit as your Community Services Officer. Part of my responsibility is setting up neighborhood watches and business watches throughout the city, as well as providing uh, crime prevention tips and safety tips to members of the community. I've worked for the Lansing Police Department for uh, almost 18 years now um, and started out as a cadet when I was 18 years old. And part of the reason why I decided to become a police officer is because I wanted to make a great impact on our society and on the community. So engaging, interacting with members of the community is kind of uh, one of the things that I enjoy doing the most. So today on Join the Team, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, a few safety tips in regards to door-to-door -door sales. Um, some of the things to remember uh, are that in order for people to sell items or to sell food while going door to door, the city of Lansing requires that they have a peddler's license or that they apply for and get approved for a peddler's license. And they should also carry that peddler's license with them when they're going door to door so that if you ask to look for it or to see it, um, they are able to provide that to you. 
Now some of the tips that uh, I'm going to suggest today uh, might require manipulating your environment to uh, prevent people from coming to your home, such as using uh, different types of signs, no trespassing signs, no solicitor signs, beware of dog signs. Those are all deterrents. There are many types of scams that we typically get complaints on. Some of those scams entail um, energy saver uh, scams where uh, people come and say that they're part of consumers energy or something along those lines and they would like to, to look at your electricity bill and help you find ways to save money. Um, there are also those home maintenance types of scams where uh, the salesperson might come and offer to do some type of yard work or maybe repair a roof or um, offer some type of household cleaning service. Those are the types of scams that we're, that we're talking about. And what I would like you to do first is to kind of um, get in the right mindset when you're dealing with solicitors. So the first thing uh, I would recommend that you do if somebody knocks on the door unannounced is to actually just take a peek outside. Don't open your door, don't open your window, look outside to see who you're potentially dealing with. Um, if you don't feel comfortable opening the door, then speak to that person through the door and see what it is specifically that they're looking for. Um, another option would be if you have a storm door or a screen door or something along those lines that you can make sure is secured. Utilizing uh, a barrier in between you when you're interacting with that person until you get comfortable with your interaction with them is uh, something that we recommend first and then find out what it is that they're soliciting and if it's something that's of interest and you would like to learn more about the recommendation is that you obtain as much information pertaining to whatever it is they're trying to sell you as well as uh, company names and phone numbers and then you take that information and do your own research Google YouTube any of the, the information that you gather uh, from the salesperson is what you use to do your own research. Let them know that you will be in contact with them and uh, to determine whether or not you want to utilize their services. Once you've done your research, then you can reach out to them uh, once you've determined that it is a legitimate company and a legitimate business and enlist uh, whatever services it is that they were soliciting at the time. Uh, another option would also be when it comes to uh, especially energy um, saving type of uh, sales salespeople when they come out and they're tr competing with Consumers Energy or they're saying they're part of Consumers Energy, uh, you can actually contact Consumers Energy at their customer services number to determine whether or not they have salespeople that are out going to door to door. Typically, Consumers Energy does not have their employees go door to door to, to solicit information. Um, they do on occasion knock on your door and provide you with different types of postcards in regards to um, different promotions that they might be offering. But at no point should they be out for asking for any personal information, any account information, uh, anything of that nature. So if you're suspicious of that, I would contact Consumers Energy um, and reach out to them to determine whether or not they actually have legitimate workers in the area. Another red flag, one of the biggest red flags is the person's demeanor. If the salesperson that you're dealing with is aggressive aggressive in nature, if they're um, very pushy or demanding, uh, if they require a lot of personal information, those are the people that you need to be suspicious of. And my recommendation is if you feel uncomfortable, then ask them to leave. If at some point they de decide that they do not want to leave, then that is when you pick up the phone and you call 911 and elicit the services of the police department. So make sure that you ask for identification from the peddler as well as uh, to see their peddler's license, which they should have them at all, at all times. Um, if there's ever a question about whether or not someone has a legitimate peddler's license, you can always contact the city clerk's office at 517-483. 4133 and they can be able uh, to confirm whether or not that person is has a legitimate license. So one of the most important things to remember is to never invite a solicitor or salesperson that you do not know into your home. Also what's important is not to provide them with cash or credit card or check information. That is the type of information that criminals use to commit crimes against you. So it looks like this house is red tag. Red tag means for some reason, the city deemed it as, you can't, well, basically you can't live here. So the only time you can be in a ragtag house is Monday through Friday through like normal business hours, which would be eight to five. So somebody called because said somebody came here and ripped the boards off the house. So we'll see if it's actually somebody that was living here and they're working on the house or if anybody's here at all or not. Yeah, so the red tag on the house is basically saying, as the police said, do not enter, it's not safe. So there's a reason that People are not supposed to be here. Obviously, I don't know what the reason is, but 
Somebody called and just said that somebody was in there, not supposed to be there, so I went and checked it out. Um, when I got there, a bunch of cars in the driveway, but it almost looks like that driveway shared the house next door to it. Um, checked all the locks and the doors on the house. Everything was secure. So the people might have left that were here because they were supposed to be in a burgundy SUV, but I don't see, all those windows are still closed. Somebody could have been in there, but I have no reasoning to go in there if I don't deem that somebody's actually in the house, which I didn't think anybody was in the house anymore. Um, so basically I have to just make sure everything's secure. If boards or windows would have been missing on the house, um, I would have ad advised dispatch and then they could have sent somebody out here to actually board up the house. So the people could have honestly reboarded it before they left, but as of right now, there doesn't look to be anybody inside. The houses still have the padlocks on them, all the doors do. Um, the windows are all secured, so there's really nothing as of right now that we can do. If somebody comes, uh, calls back, we'll come check on it again, but I'll kind of probably just come back through here before my shift's done and just see if anybody's in here. Um, other than that, I mean, nobody's in the area, so there's nobody I can talk to to get really further info on it. So if somebody calls back later, we can go back there and check it out again. But like I said, I'll probably swing back through there a little bit later and just check on it and see if somebody's, you know, kind of going through it. Because it either could be the previous owner that lived there trying to get stuff out of the house, or it could be possibly a homeless person that's just trying to break in because they need somewhere to stay. I don't necessarily like when calls end up happening like that, but for something like that, I mean, I don't want to take somebody to jail over something like that. I mean, there's a reason, maybe you don't know what's going on in their life. I mean, something bad could be going on and that's the reason why, you know, they, maybe they didn't keep the house up to code um, or it's just a homeless person. There's not really a reason for me to want to necessarily take somebody to jail. Now, if it's like an ongoing thing, then that's different, but sometimes for calls like that, it is better to not have stuff to do. Because I'm not out here trying to just terrorize people and make their life hard. So probably is better that nobody's there. So in all of our cars, we have spots in the back. Uh, it's kind of like right by the driver's seat, but it's tucked back. Um, we have a spot for um, rifles, so we have an AR, I have my AR. Every police, um, every police officer on the department has their own issued AR, and you get your own two magazines with it. It has, like your, has a certain number that's identified with you to it. But um, anytime, normally, obviously on patrol, if you're working, you want to bring, they want us to bring our ARs with us and lock them up in the car. Um, we have them just for protection. It's not just for our safety, it's for everybody else's. Um, especially, you know, during the climate that we are in today, you see a lot more, unfor it's unfortunate, but you see a lot more school shootings, you see a lot more, um, you know, almost massacres happening. So that's one reason why we do have them because it is a high power uh, weapon. We, I would never take it out like on any any like call that I've been on today. I wouldn't, you know, take it out. I we more so only take it out if we know that there's more of a serious weapon threat involved with another, you know, with somebody else having a weapon. Um, just because it is a high power weapon and it does give us a little more of an advantage and it, um, you know, helps us do the job that we need to do. So my duty weapon, when you know you first start, has a serial number on it. Um, the department will write down the serial number of the weapon they're issuing you. Um, and I don't know if they you to put it in a computer database or anything like that. But everybody, it, it's on record that each person has this handgun and this is the serial number associated with that handgun. So we know, God forbid, but if somebody ended up having to use their firearm or anything, it's, it's tied to you so you know whose is whose. And then our ARs, um, I'm sure they write down the um, duty weapon on that as well, but um, like mine has an actual number written on the side of it, and it goes in a certain slot in the um, op center, which is where we'll get them out of the armory every day, and uh, that one is specifically associated with me. And then the mags um, have my badge number on them, so everybody knows that it's mine. This part is like for the car where it works our lights and sirens. So if our lights and sirens come on or if I hit the switch all the way over, which ignites every light on our car, this camera up here will automatically start recording as well as this camera, my body camera, automatically turns on. So they're all synced. So if any time we're running lights and sirens, it's nice. Like you don't have to worry about hitting all this stuff on. If we switch the switch all the way over, 
then it will automatically start recording. Anytime if we need to get our AR, it's actually locked in there, but there are buttons. Obviously, I can't show you exactly which ones they are, but if you hit certain buttons up here, it releases the AR and we can actually take it out. Um, also, this part right here, you can open it up. You can't really see on the inside of it, but it is the printer, so anytime we write a ticket, it gets printed out here and you get to rip it and you just have a hard copy. You don't have to actually write it. it syncs up with the computer. Um, this is the microphone, like the loudspeaker that goes over the car. If we talk into it, you know, it projects out. It's actually pretty loud. Um, have our normal radio to talk to dispatch right here. We have the cameras always that are in the cars. If we get on a call, you know, you hit record on that. If we have anybody in the back seat, arrested or not arrested, even if we're just transporting somebody, like somebody needs a ride or anything like that, we're doing like a courtesy transport we're always supposed to be recording them. Um, and then our body cameras, anytime we're coming in contact with a citizen or anything like that, we're supposed to be recording. Honestly, I mean, I think it's a great tool. Even if something comes up later, you know, you forget something to write in a report, you can't remember exactly what somebody told you to document it in a report, you can go back later and you can look at it while you're writing reports, anything like that. But just personally, I mean, if you know you're doing your job and you're doing the right thing. I mean, the cameras aren't there to necessarily hem us up or hurt us. It's there to protect us, especially with stuff going on nowadays. I mean, people like to necessarily, not everybody, but you do have people that like to say, we're doing the wrong thing, we're doing this, we're being unconstitutional, and the cameras are there to show that we are doing our job and we're doing exactly everything that, you know, we were trained to do. So I definitely think the cameras are a good feature and a good helping point for our department and every other police department. Hi, I'm Chief Mike Jankowski, Chief of Police for the Lansing Police Department. This past May, the Lansing Police Department celebrated 125 years of providing police service to the city of Lansing. Throughout those 125 years, the Lansing Police Department has been a leader in innovative policing and a founder of community policing. During the event on May 5th, we had an opportunity to show our citizens the history, the men and women who provided policing services to this great capital city here in the state of Michigan. Not only in May did we have our 125th anniversary, we had the opportunity to thank the men and women of the Lansing Police Department and citizens that went above and beyond the call of duty during our annual award ceremony. If you get an opportunity, please watch City TV and you can watch both events. As we approach the summer months, I want to have a few reminders to our citizens and business owners. The number two issues that we come around uh, each and every summer is speeders in our neighborhoods and larceny from vehicles. Please make sure that when you're driving in our neighborhoods that you're obeying the speeds and, and the stop signs. We have many kids that are out and about that are playing and we certainly don't want to see a tragedy. So keep your speeds down in our neighborhoods. The second issue that we always see an increase here in the summertime is the larceny from vehicles. So please make sure that you are locking your car doors, rolling up your windows, and not leaving valuables in your cars when you're leaving your vehicles. So we look forward to the summer months here in the city of Lansing. We have many great events. We have the all-star game here at Cooley Law Stadium in June. We have 4th of July, Common Ground, and just about every single week there's an event going on here in the city of Lansing. This is an opportunity for you to get out and enjoy our city, knowing and understanding that the Lansing Police Department will have over 50 community events this summer alone. Please come on out and enjoy those events with the Lansing Police Department this summer. So the call I'm going to right now is a traffic stop that East Lansing Police Department did. Um, sounds like the subject being uncooperative. So. Twenty-five. Slow down, but continue. Sounds like they're right at the intersection. Ten four. So I'm just heading over there to help them. Sounds like they're having um, somebody that's not being cooperative with them. So since it's such a borderline um, police department, we help each other a lot. So I'm gonna head down to Kalamazoo and Clipper just to see if they needed any assistance with the traffic stop. Yeah, we're in the area. Tower. Hey, are you guys all set then? Yeah, we're good, okay, yep, no problem. With East Lansing Police Department and the Michigan State Police Department, like actual campus, um, we do, we, we border some streets, so, you know, if they're out on a traffic stop or we are and it's really close to the borderline, if we don't have necessarily units that are close or if we have other units tied up, we'll kind of assist each other on different types of calls. 
mail just walked out with a basket. Um, headed towards the family dollar from right here. He took a Valentine's basket. It's gonna be in, un or check that. Black mail, white hat, black hoodie, and red shoes. 25, I'll start heading that way. 10 4, I can get you another. I'm gonna have to check the area and make contact with the store. Our caller was a passerby. 10 4, I'll start checking the area. So, uh, retail fraud, so somebody stole something from a store, just occurred um, at the Rite Aid on Michigan Avenue, so it's actually in my sector. Um, some passerby is saying that somebody, so the store is not actually calling a passerby is saying that somebody stole a Valentine's basket from the store, so we're going to head over there and start checking the area to see if, actually, to see if that person is still in the area. Try to make contact with them and see what's going on. What's up? I guess, I don't know. He went farther down. Like way far? Yeah, he's probably down, probably going towards the bus station on one of the streets. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. But he got on a white hat, some red pants, red shoes, black pants, and a gray hoodie. Okay, cool. So I'm on that retail fraud call and a citizen asked if I was looking for the guy that's actually being described that possibly stole Valentine's Day basket. So he approached me and said that the guy kept going westbound, maybe towards the Catabus station. Um, and that he basically described the perfect description of him, that he's wearing a white hat, black pants, red shoes, black man. are you available for a transport? I'm gonna start heading down more westbound from here and see if I can find the guy. He's right there on he's right there in Kalamazoo, I see him. Yeah. Yeah, but this guy's matching it pretty good. Hey man, can I talk to you for a second? Just for a second. You're not necessarily in trouble or nothing like that. Okay, just go. Just let me pat you down just for a second, okay? I will just talk to you. Uh, you get my book with you. We're at. Right here. Where's right here? What uh, building? The building, like. Right what's it called? Corner. Like, what, what center were you going the, to? To get the original books, you get the layer at the corner. Okay. Okay. You can, there, I got where are you at? Names and everything. I believe. I believe you, man. Okay. You might. You. You. You're just matching. A description of somebody yeah. close to us, not necessarily it, but that's why I'm yeah, just wanting to. Right no, you're fine. You're I just good, do you care okay. if I just check your backpack real quick? Is that's it. it. My backpack? Yeah, I just wanna you can hold it and open it up. I just, I just wanna just make just sure nothing's in it. Somebody stole something from a store, so we're just oh, he's all set. Okay, you're good man. You just yeah, yeah. you're pretty hey, close matching the description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, c
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they said that, that's exactly what I thought, Bill. Yeah. I was like, okay, we got another guy with red shoes. Yeah, but he's got like a green. We got a kid on man. Yeah, that must be happening this year. What, the red shoes? Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get me a pair of They're too, prevalent though. down here. Boot, red boots, red shoes. I don't even think the store knows about it. There's a passerby that called. Really? I guess, yeah. Thanks, guys. So, so we, have we run across and called 911 or call you guys or what? You have the not, you have an emergency number? Yes. Just call an emergency. Okay. That's gotcha. fine. Yeah, it's not. It's not that big. Yeah. Okay. Crazy on me. He stole a Valentine's Day basket. <laughs> Maybe he's just trying to make a sweetie. Like, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Be safe, guys. Thank you. We searched the area. We weren't able to find him. Um, we don't even know necessarily if he did steal the basket because it's just a passerby calling. Um, so they could have seen something totally different. Yeah. This guy could have actually purchased it and walked out. And if, and if the business isn't calling that they've had something stolen. There's not ne necessarily even a crime yeah, going on. Yeah, even have a crime at the, at the moment. But we could have stopped and talked to the person. Uh, just on just reasonable suspicion of uh, what's going on. So just to kind of clear it up, but without finding him. There's really no crime right now that we can even prove happened, especially with the victim, which is the store, not even calling us. That doesn't even necessarily mean that there's a crime going on. Absolutely. So, looks like another case unsolved. Here. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. So what, you called TVS? Yeah, or? so I contacted TVS and they just said that they just want to ban. It was such, they, they already put it into like their, their loss uh, items. So they already kind of had it set aside. They don't want to press charges, they just want to ban. And uh, he was here apparently. He saw him with the basket and all the Valentine's uh, Day gifts. Whatnot. So it was definitely him. He probably jumped on a bus. Okay. Hi, I'm Detention Officer Patty Lane. I thought I'd just take you through our day to day operations here in the jail. The first place I'm going to show you is the juvenile cell. We get juveniles from the ages of as young as eight until 16. They can only be in our facility for six hours by law. Um, they're held here, away from sight and sound of adults. This is our detention um, LEAN position. LEAN stands for Law Enforcement Information Network. This position is manned 24 hours a day. It is a secure position. Um, no one other than personnel that are um, trained in LEAN can operate it. For this position, we run people for warrants, criminal histories, uh, vehicle and driver information, and driver's license information. We also get messages from outside agencies and respond to messages to outside agencies. This is a bullpen. It's a large room that we use to house um, prisoners while they're here in our detention facility. This actually used to be four smaller units, um, but because of increase of arrests back in the early 90s, uh, the cell was enlarged. There are telephones on both ends of the cells. Those are used um, to make collect calls only. That's the only way that people are allowed to um, call out. Um, you can see that there are cameras on both ends of the cell. We use those to monitor people 24-7. They ask to have the lights turned out, but of course we can't do that. There are no blankets and pillows given out when they come to jail. So this is the isolation area. We have two. This one is used primarily for people who have medical conditions and maybe some mental health issues and they can't be in a cell with um, a, a group of people. Um, these cells are, they don't have telephone privileges. These cells are individual. 
they are probably the most comfortable of the cells that we have. The Lansing Detention Facility is a 72-hour lockup. What that means is you will never be in this jail for longer than 72 hours. You will see the judge during the week, every day of the week. On weekends, you will see the judge if you have a felony without bond or a dis domestic assault case without bond. Also, judges are available for the felonies without bonds and domestic assault cases on weekends and holidays. This is the second of our isolation areas. This area is used as a step down for people who are highly intoxicated or under the influence of narcotics and have to be watched very closely. Also for behavior problems and people who um, we've had physical issues with at booking. We bring them in here and we encourage them to drink water and to try and sleep off whatever they have in their system. Um, and once they reach about a 07 or a little bit higher if their behavior has changed, we'll move them to the general population cells so that they can call um, family members or friends and arrange bonds so that they can go home. When you come to jail for a new charge or a warrant, you'll have to be fingerprinted and have your mugshot taken. This is our fingerprint machine. It's done without ink. It's done with water. You'll be asked to wash your hands and keep them wet. Mugshot, you'll be asked to stand right over there and they'll take the pictures. This is a very crucial time. When someone comes into the booking area, they're asked a lot of personal questions. They're asked about their medical health. They're asked about whether or not they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. We use all of this information, plus our observation of the individual to determine if they should need medical attention prior to being placed in the cell, whether they um, have any special needs that that would require us to um, place them in the isolation areas. And we also take information from the arresting officers. There's a sign posted to the right of the booking desk that asks specific questions about the person's behavior, about suicide tendencies. All of this information is used to evaluate the individual that's being brought to jail. So day to day, we have uh, any number of things that go on in here. We have people coming in from the Ingham County Jail to be seen by our district court judges. We also have people coming in on arrests. Um, we have people turning themselves in at the counter, plus the telephone's ringing and we're monitoring everybody in the back. I might add also that even though we monitor everyone by camera, we are walking through several times an hour, um, talking to people, checking on them, making sure everything is okay in the back. Part of the process for a drunk driver that's brought to jail is taking a breathalyzer. This is done by a um, certified police officer, and it is something that is used in their court case. This is a suicide prevention apparatus, I'll call it. Uh, this is used when someone continually is taking off items of their clothing and trying to hurt themselves with it. Um, until we can get the paperwork done and get them sent to community mental health to be evaluated, uh, we will put them in the suit. Our detention officers train once a year, annual training. We do defensive tactics, first aid, suicide prevention, and any other relevant um, item that has come up during the year prior to the training. We're moving away from hard restraints like 
the chair and moving into things like soft restraints. If you noticed over on the wall, the belts and cuffs and helmets are used instead of putting people in the chair. That's now a last resort. We don't do that anymore very much. Once officers come into the jail area, um, they get off the elevator right behind me. They'll go through the door on the right, but before they can enter our area, they have to lock up their weapons, and that's done in this area right behind me also. There are no guns in the detention facility allowed. There are no weapons allowed past this point in the jail, because if something happens over here in the booking area, um, and the officer's first instinct is to run over here and help us. Unfortunately, if they have their guns on, they're putting everyone at risk. 10 4 targets agree. Uh, trailblazer actually are callers in a gray Durango. Okay, so right now, Olson and I are getting. Um, sent to a police assist call. We have an actual U.S. Marshal. We have a U.S. Marshal that is trying to make a traffic stop for a felony person that's um, made a parole violation. He's wanted out of Mississippi. So he, they're, uh, they're sending us to this to try to make a traffic stop on this green trailblazer that has the felony occupant inside, so right now we're trying to get in the area. It's heading northbound, so we're trying to make a traffic stop on it. Yeah, we got to, they're not letting us sit over here in the school zone, gotcha. our okay. command. So if he comes back, we, we can wait down the street. So right now, the person that has the parole warrant or um, that the marshals are following, they pulled into a school, so we don't want to make a traffic stop in a school zone. So we're told, since we're now te technically in Lansing Township and not in the city of Lansing, we're going to head back and try to wait in the city right on the borderline and just wait and see if uh, the township's going to make a traffic stop in them, and so then we can be right here to help them out. <laughs> Put your hands up! Turn around! So what ended up happening is we made the traffic stop. The reason that we did it the way we did is because we knew he was a felon and he had a felony um, parole. I don't know if it was a absconder. I'm not really sure exactly what it was, but he's wanted for a felony. Um, the reason we did the traffic stop like that is because he's wanted for a felony. We don't know if he's armed or dangerous. So that setup was called a felony traffic stop. It's basically where one officer comes over the PA and tells the people in the car what to do. This helps, you know, for safety precautions, just keep everybody safe. But that's the reason why some of us had our guns down at the low ready, was just for safety precaution. You guys want all occupants out? Yeah, sure, I'll get it. You're... I just wanted him. All right, just wanted guys. Just keep your, yep, just, you're good. Oh, okay. Just, yep. I'm sorry, I no, 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 you're fine. So. The marshals, the guy in the car, I don't really know too much, but he has a parole, okay? He's wanted, he's out of Mississippi. So that's why we're making the traffic stop, because they knew that he was in this car with you, okay? Oh. You're not necessarily <laughs> in trouble or anything. We just want okay. to make sure. I got my nephew, and I'm like, what, who's picking him up from school? No, no, yep, you're fine. You're just, yeah. we're just letting you know. Can I see your ID really quick, though? Sure. I thanks for your, one here? yep, okay. thanks for your cooperation. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, no problem whatsoever. Yep, he just, he's wanted out of Mississippi first parole, okay? Oh, wow. So that's what's going on. I'm shaking, I'm sorry. Nope, you're fine. I'll be back up in just a little bit. I'm just going to hang out with you for a second, okay? okay? Just to make sure everything's good. But, okay. yep, I appreciate it. Thank you. So he, oh, wow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, obviously, everything. Right. Um, 
but that's that's the reason why. Okay. okay? They knew he was in the car, so that's that's why. Oh. So you're not in trouble or anything like that. That's fine. Okay. Yep. Did you guys need the he, the township took her ID? Did you guys need anything with her? Or? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Back open on North. Okay. Got you. Got you. So, what's up? Yep, thank you. <coughs> so right now, they have, the marshals have who they want in custody, but we're still obviously gonna investigate it. Um, they're gonna do other further investigations. I don't really know all about it, but we're gonna stand by in case they need help with anything. They might search the car, so that's why we're gonna stand by for right now. Just stand by with her for right now, you want us to? Yeah, no problem. Not that, sorry, we just gotta stand, just because of what happened, okay? So, not that I don't believe you, not that I don't trust you, it's just, it's a safety protocol, okay? I definitely understand. Um, he, he wants me to stand by because I have a question her because I guess he's like a registered sex offender, so he can't be in the car with a minor or anything like that. I don't know. Under, I mean under, the, oh, right, right. Yeah, so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm obviously just a city police officer. The U.S. federal marshals knew that he was in this car. I don't know how, but that's, yeah, they recognized him. They knew it. So that's why, okay? Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. See ya. They, uh, the marshals we were able to detain and um, put in handcuffs the guy that they wanted. They're all set. They're going to keep doing their investigation so they don't need the city police anymore. I haven't been updating my daily enough, so I'm going to actually pull over and get caught up, type my daily before I get way too far behind. Daily is that um, activity report that basically every call that I've been dispatched to or if I like check a business, if I do like a traffic stop, anything like that, we just record like approximate, you know, the time that we did it and what outcome came with it. If we did a report, if we arrest somebody. So it just documents what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I am Lansing Detention Officer Lori Reidenauer and featured as Lansing's Most Wanted is Diane Renee Hazel. Hazel has a felony warrant for possession of controlled substance. She is 38 years old, stands 5 feet 2, weighs 185 pounds. Help us bring Hazel to justice and face her charge. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Join the Team. We look forward to seeing you next time. As your downtown community police officer, I just want you to be cautious with the warmer weather. There's going to be more pedestrians and bicyclists out and about. Please be safe. <laughs>